So my brothers and sisters, now we look back at how these great companions dealt with power and the love of power. We look at Umar ibn al-Khattab, how he was just so special and different. He was a black and white person who truly and quite oddly acted in ways that to us today we think why. But then we discover, subhanallah, he is truly the one whom the shaitan has no power over his sincerity. You'll see, insha'Allah, that his deen and his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger came first even before himself. So, Umar ibn al-Khattab. If you recall, brothers and sisters, we talked about, during the whole biography, we mentioned about two lessons ago about the great companion Khalid ibn al-Walid, radiyallahu anhu. And we said how he is the greatest commander of any army ever to exist till today. Khalid ibn Walid and Umar radiallahu anhu were a competition before Islam and even after Islam. And it got to a point where Amir al-Mu'minin Umar radiallahu anhu, he took Khalid ibn Walid off the commanding post when Abu Bakr had placed him and the Prophet called him Allah's unsheathed sword. I'm not going to go into the details, there's no need. But the point that I want to make here, that we want to finish off insha'Allah, is that it created a tension between Umar and Khalid ibn Walid. Two great companions had a slight tension towards each other. More so from Khalid towards Umar. Now Khalid radiallahu anhu was a distance away. He's in a place called Sham and he's in Iraq. He's all the way there. He's been there for decade, two de or nearly two decades now, fighting the wars and conquering and conquesting. Umar radiallahu was back in Medina all this time. So there's a distance and there's no telephones, there's no mobile phones. They just would send someone to go gallop on a horse for two months to get to him with one letter. So you can imagine the miscommunication that can happen. Yet subhanallah, because they were so eloquent in their words, the miscommunication, there was only small marginal room for miscommunication. Today subhanallah, we send each other night and day messages and we still misunderstand each other. A lot of our sisters, they love emojis. Men don't understand emojis, my dear sister. Stop it. <laughs> we have to do courses to understand it. My brothers and sisters, I'm, not, I'm just joking about that, of course. But I'm saying that miscommunication, even with technology today, is very difficult. But they communicate very, very well. Yet, you can imagine, two months' journey, there's going to be miscommunication, misunderstanding. And people are so, so naturally drawn to assume the worst of something except very few people, subhanAllah, whose hearts are safe from that. But most of us, we assume, especially from a distance. And that's why when you cut off someone, you don't talk to them for a while, and then you hear something about them, or they hear something about you. Unfortunately, the shaitan makes you think the worst until you get closer and you talk. You have to talk, brothers and sisters. And then you realize that the other person didn't mean exactly what you were assuming, or, or you didn't mean what they were assuming, and you're thinking, they don't know what I'm thinking, and then big enmity happens until you get closer and you talk and you communicate. Brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of disagreements and don't be afraid of conflict. It's not conflict, it's not disagreements. It's always the attitude that we come with when we disagree. That's the problem. Most conflicts in the world is not because of disagreements, because of the attitude that you and I we, we, we place, we become rude, we don't let the other person speak, we want to overlap each other, or we may have our own whims and desires, we have our own motives, we have our own assumptions, so sometimes I might not let you talk because I don't want to hear what you say, or maybe you will shut me up, I've got an ego, I don't want you to shut me up, so I'll just speak over you. Brothers and sisters, be careful as the Prophet ﷺ did say that among the signs of a hypocrite, we're well, not calling each other hypocrites here, but he says the hypocrites used to do that and he, in his time. وَإِذَا خَاصَ فَجَرْ when they go into disagreements with someone, they explode, they become immoral. They swear, they shout, they yell, they, over, uh, they, they, um, they try to silence you, they try to make everybody look like you're the one that's harming them. They start shouting and, and doing things so that people can think that you have a right. And the moment the other person is quiet, it's the ego that comes in and you've got people on your side falsely. Don't listen to the shaitan in that way is what causes great conflicts and great enmities. So Khalid radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhuma, there was this slight tension that developed really from Khalid's side, not from Umar radiallahu anhu. You'll find out why. The only reason why Umar radiallahu anhu took him off his command post was because Umar's intention was that he feared that the Muslims will put too much trust in Khalid ibn Walid's amazingness, his, uh, his, his great 
power that Allah had given him in winning battles and forget to put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And that actually means that he is praising Khalid rather than putting him down, to be honest. He's telling them that Khalid will never lose. Allah has given him victory forever. And on the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu if his sword comes out, it, can, no one, it will not return without victory. He's literally praising him. He's not talking about Khalid being a bad person. He's not saying that I've got anything against him. But he's telling them he's, he's afraid for the Muslims. That's what the, the leader really thinks about. He doesn't think about himself, doesn't think about individuals, doesn't think about monetary things. Or He thinks about the community, he thinks about the responsibility that Allah has given him. And that's what really he had to make these decisions. Anyway, after a long time, some people assumed that Khalid, he had betrayed somehow. He had cheated, he had done something wrong. That's why Omar told him to get off the post. So all these assumptions from the shaitan came to people, some of them, and Khalid anhu heard some things and he was in doubt. So the day came when Khalid returned from Asham, Asham is greater Syria. He came to Medina, this was only a few years before Khalid, Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu uh, uh, was stricken with the plague. He died 40 years after it, but this was a few years before Umar radiallahu anhu died. He enters Medina, Khalid bin Walid, for the first time now and after nearly 20 years. He sees Umar radiallahu anhu, maybe less than 20 years, maybe something like less than 15. And he saw Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar in front of everybody, he comes up to him and Khan Walid comes down. They hug each other. That's the first thing they do. They hug each other. They say salam to each other. They ask about each other. There's nothing personal between them. And this is what happens when you don't talk to someone. Okay, they may have harmed you for something personal. Or you may harm them. And you, don't, and you want to minimize your contact with them for some reason, but at least there are six rights of a Muslim upon another Muslim. One of them is that if they say salam to you, you must reply, wa alaykum as salam. If they sneeze and say alhamdulillah, you have to say to them, yarhamkum Allah, may Allah have mercy on you. If they get sick, you should check on them. If they ask you for advice and you can give them advice, even if you don't like them, you have to give them some sincere advice if you're able to. And if you don't want to, you say, forgive me, brother, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing. The point is you don't just cut them off completely, completely. If they die and you can go to their funeral, you go. If they have a wedding and they invite you to their son or their daughter's wedding and you are able to attend, then you should attend, otherwise apologize. It, it doesn't, when we, when we don't talk to someone, it's not, for a Muslim, it's not, that's it. It's like they don't exist, they've died or something. No, there's still some little tiny hair between you and I. And it's a difference between if you don't want to forgive someone you don't have to forgive someone who wronged you if you don't want to. That's your right. If you can forgive and find a way to reconcile, that's better. But some people actually don't deserve to be forgiven either. I'm not telling you, you have to. Some people, if you forgive them, they get worse. But it doesn't mean you negate everything else. I see you in the masjid just because of one thing that happened between me and you. I, don't, I, I turn this way, you turn the other way. We even avoid each other so that we don't say salamu alaykum. And with, with that selfish, we become that selfish that we don't even want to say, I don't even want to say salamu alaykum to you. La ilaha illallah. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that among the most selfish of people is the one who doesn't even want to say salam to someone. Assalamu alaykum. May peace and security be on you. What's the problem with that? You know, assalam, the word salam is a dua. You're making dua for your brother or your sister. And how about thinking about this way? When you say salamu alaykum to someone, even if you don't like them, for the sake of Allah, there's an angel. There's an angel that makes dua for you. The angel says, and you have the same as what you made dua for your brother. Assalamu alaikum is a dua from Allah that may peace and security of Allah be upon you. You say, may Allah forgive every Muslim and every believer. You know, have you ever tried that? When somebody's hurt you and you make dua for them? Some people they say with family, sorry brothers and sisters, if I went on a bit of a tangent here, I think this is important to talk about a little bit at least. Because people misunderstand what it means to cut off and forgiveness and all that stuff. And if sometimes we say family, I'll cut them off completely, they're toxic. Yeah, why don't you turn and think about it a different way? Have you ever thought about making dua for them? Oh Allah, guide my father, guide my mother, guide my brother, guide my sister. Now you feel sorry for them. You feel sympathy for them and you ask Allah to guide them. Why not guide them? Some people have their hatred so much that they say, it doesn't deserve to be guided. I'm not even going to ask Allah to guide them. La ilaha illallah. Are you more merciful than Allah? Guidance is from Allah. If he knows they don't deserve it, he won't. But you're the one that's going to benefit. The angel's going to make dua for you. Ibrahim alayhi salam was kicked out by his father, the great prophet. And his father said to him, I will stone you to death if you don't leave me. And he disowned him. He kicked him out on the street and allowed to come back home. 
And Ibrahim A.S. instead of looking at him and saying, you're not a father to me and you're toxic and I hate you and all that stuff, or feeling sorry for himself, Ibrahim A.S. looks at his father and said, my father, I fear upon you misguidance. I will ask Allah to forgive you. I will ask Allah to forgive you, ya abati. My Lord never leaves me. It's not, you know, your fatherhood is not the thing that's going to save me. Allah is. But I fear for you, Dad, because I love you. We feel sorry for people who do the wrong thing. Our children, our friends, our relatives. So my brothers and sisters, you don't need to be like them. Yeah, you don't want to forgive someone for something or, or another. That's fine. You don't have to. But you don't deny all the other rights of a Muslim upon another Muslim. Is there anyone of us here who is perfect in every way? Have we never hurt anyone? Have you and I never hurt anyone before? I'm sure that if we were to check, Allahu Akbar probably hurt more than a more than hundred people just in the past year. Just because some people forgive, some people don't talk. Every one of us has this. So my dear brothers and sisters, if we can forgive, we can. If we can't, that's fine. But still don't deny the other rights. Still have some goodness in you. Otherwise, nobody, everybody will be toxic to everyone. Everybody will be toxic. If we're going to go by that mindset, everyone's toxic. Is that how we're going to live? This is why we're here in the masjid. We see each other. We renew. We break the shaitan. The first one to say the salam to the other will get the reward. That's it. Yeah, well, um, for example, if, if, you, if I owe you money and I come to you and say I'm never going to pay it, and you say to me I'm not going to forgive you, I'm the one that has to be scared. I don't come up to you and say you have to forgive me or my brother and I blackmail you with hadiths. You have to love for your brother what you love for yourself. Subhanallah. That hadith, you have to love for your brother what you love for yourself, is the other way around. It's when I come to you and I want to, let's say I want to, I want to do something for you and you haven't asked and I insist and you know, you feel overwhelmed and you're happy about it. And I say to you, Akhi, because I've got to love for you what I love for myself. That way, when I offer you a service, not the other way around, when uh, you know, I, I, I blackmail and say, sell me that product, brother. I know you've got a business. Give me a discount. Love for your brother what you love for yourself. Give me a discount because you've got to love me like the way you love yourself. It's a new trend. How to blackmail your brother with Islam. It should be the other way around. So, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is a Muslim can love, can still love a person from an angle. Hate, you can dislike something about him from another angle, but not altogether. Yani. There's still some little hairs between us, some little strings between us, inshallah. That, in a nutshell, Khalid bin Walid comes in, Umar ibn Khattab, See, for nearly 10, 15 years, people have said Khalid's this and Khalid's been hearing words. Can you imagine 10, 15 years you're hearing these words from people and you don't know the truth and you're far away? The Amir al Mu'minin has put him away aside because he's done something wrong. He's got a stigma on him for nearly 15 years. That's harsh. He comes back, they hug each other, and Umar radiallahu anhu makes a poem about Khalid, a beautiful poem. Now you might think that's a, it's what we do when we want to suck up to someone. That's not true. Umar ibn Khattab was known for his honesty. He doesn't care. And he made a poem for him to show that we are brothers. And then Khalid said to him, Ya Amir al muminin you've wronged me. You've, you've treated me harshly. You've hurt me. So Khalid Walid was also one of those like Umar just spoke the truth. Watch this now how people who love each other for the sake of Allah, they are frank with you. And they do it sincerely. There's no two-faced approaches between these people, these companions. He says, Ya Umar, you've hurt me. You really wronged me. It's been such a long time and I've been holding something here. I've got, I've, got, I've got this ugly feeling towards you because of this. People said about me I was betraying and all that stuff because of what you did. I had to live with it. So he said, he told him his feelings and he knows that Umar will listen. And then Umar turns around and he said, Ya Khalid, Wallahi, in front of these people, I did not tell you to get off the commanding post except because I didn't want the hearts of the Muslims to put their trust in you because I fear that the Muslims will lose. As the Prophet Sallallahu taught us. And then he looks around, Umar, and he sees that Khalid's brought lots of fortune with him. And he says, Ya Khalid, all this fortune is yours? He goes, yes, I fought big people. Really rich people. And you know, when you're a warrior in the army of the Muslims, you have a share. Allah has written in the Quran that the warriors have a share. He goes, I fought a lot and I got a lot of share. And Omar said, that's a lot. And Khalid said, okay, how about you count it? If you find more than 60,000 dinars, anything extra to that, I give away to the Muslims. And then Omar, what do you think he's going to say now? 
We would say, it's okay, Akhi, khalas, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless it for you. I believe you. And he said, okay. He brings all his men. He says, count his money. <laughs> Takes his money inside, counts every single dirham. It's like saying every cent. And they said, it equaled 80,000 dinars. He said, take 20,000 as he promised and give it to the Muslims. <laughs> and give him back his 60,000. Yeah, he's just, he's just so harsh and down the line. Khalid Marid looks at it, he goes, okay, give it to the Muslims. And then Umar comes back to Khalid and he says, Ya Khalid, come here. In front of everybody, he says, Wallahi, you are a generous man. Khalid probably was going to look at him and think, what are you doing, man? What do you mean generous? What's this? You just took my money. But he didn't say that. Then he said to him, but I am a businessman for the Muslims, on behalf of the Muslims. I am their broker. So when you said this is for the Muslims, I am going to haggle you for them. Not for me, for the Muslims. And so he took a see how it's not about himself. And truly it was given to the poor and the needy and the widows and the orphans of the Muslims. And Khalid bin Walid, when he realized that, he couldn't, he actually ended up loving Umar radiallahu anhu. His heart started to soften towards him. And then Umar wrote a big letter about the whole situation and talking how innocent Khalid is and how great he is the unsheathed sword of Allah and that the only reason why he did this was because he was feared for the Muslims to lose their power and trust in Allah. And he kept talking and talking and talking until Khalid was so happy and he just forgave everything about Umar and Umar's heart was, has always loved Khalid anyway. And Khalid Walid says, after I, I was so happy that I met Umar that day and I came face to face and after 10 to 15 years, in that, in that one day, just that few, little bit of conversation, just a little bit of communication, everything was resolved. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, sometimes we may not talk to a person for 15, 20 years of our lives and sometimes we come back to talk with only a day or two, everything's resolved. A little bit of talking, a little bit of communication. You know, empty your hearts a little bit and just try to understand where the other person's coming from. Let them understand where you're coming from. Don't be afraid. So my brothers and sisters, I've done this many times. Alhamdulillah, it's worked so many times. And inshallah, we can do that. Communication. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Khalid ibn al-Walid goes back to Hims in Syria. And as I told you last week, the great plague happened, the plague of Amawas. And among the people who died in that plague was Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. He was one of the ten promised paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ called him Aminu Hadihi al-Ummah, the trustworthy of this Ummah. Had he lived on, Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu said, had Abu Ubaidah lived on to the moment of my death, I would have elected him to be the next Khalifa. And then after him, a man by the name of Sulaim radiallahu anhu, he was a, a slave who was freed of Abdurrahman ibn Awf, I think, one of the companions. And he was the next in line. He also died in the plague of Amawas. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, had he still been living, I would have elected him and proposed him for the Khilafah after me. Do you realize he was a slave? Naam? Mawla Hudayfa. Radiallahu anhu, jazakallahu khair, not Abdurrahman. So he was a slave of Hudayfa. And you can see, brothers and sisters, Islam does not look at you based on your status, who you are, where you come from, what your color is, what your language is, what your gender is, what your uh, wealth is. No. This man was a slave and he said, I would have elected him to be the Khalifa. Why? Based on his character and what the Prophet ﷺ said about him. He is trustworthy and honest and able to lead this nation. That's what, that's what really matters. But subhanallah, they died. Khalid bin Walid, you would not believe, he had over 40 children. <laughs> Maybe 50 or 60, Allahu A'lam. And uh, 40 of his children died in those two years of the plague. All of those 40 children, they died. And he only had about three or five or something like that left. And uh, it was terrible for Khalid bin Walid. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted the plague. And I talked about that last week. And Khan Walid stayed there really sick and unable to be what he was before. He got a disease in his lungs and he stayed like that for a long time. Unable to take part in battles again. 
And there were many battles after that which, which burnt Khalid Walid's heart and ripped it apart that he couldn't take part in it. But he said, although my heart is shattered that I cannot go and help the Muslims in their battles, I am also equally happy that my heart is now clean towards my brother Amir al-Mu'min Umar radiallahu anhu. And he died uh, radiallahu anhu, Khalid bin Walid saying, here I am, there is a place in my body that does not have a stab wound or an arrow wound or a dagger or an injury. I've got scars all over my body. It was said that he had more than 70 different stab wounds in his body. And they were all from the front, none from the back. So he never turned his back in a battle, Khalid bin Walid And he said, I sought martyrdom in every battle. There isn't a battle, uh, didn't, wasn't with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after I became Muslim. And there isn't a battle of the Muslims except I was in seeking martyrdom. And here I am. And he said the famous word, here I am dying like a camel. Just from a sickness. And then he said, Ma namat aynul jubana. May the cowards never sleep and enjoy their sleep. Meaning that here I am, I was facing death, I wanted death, I was seeking it and I couldn't get it. Martyrdom. So my brothers and sisters, uh, the virtues are given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously Khad Walid did not die in battle because of what the Prophet peace be upon him said. He said he was the unsheathed sword of Allah. How could Allah let Khad Walid be broken by the enemy? And that was the reason why. رضي الله عنهم أجمعين May Allah be pleased with them all and how they dealt with each other لا إله إلا الله You can see brothers and sisters when Iblis said to Allah وعزتك وجلالك لأغوينهم أجمعين By your might and power O Lord I am going to lead them all astray all of the children of Adam and then he said إلا عبادك منهم المخلصين Except your slaves among them who are truly sincere and honest that he has no power over them. Khalid bin Walid is sincere and honest. Umar is sincere and honest. And you see their differences were not about themselves. It was never personal. It was not about dunya. It's not about monetary stuff. It was never about themselves. It was always about the bigger picture. It was for the sake of Allah and for the ummah. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? This, is the, this was the issue. Alhamdulillah. My brothers and sisters, a little bit more about Umar radiallahu anhu. Just to talk about he, what he did. These were special things that Umar Dilano did in what we call his administration in Medina. So he laid laws down, he established new rules, new policies that we still practice till today in lots of Western countries. Here in Australia, we practice them. One of them, he is the one who established the welfare system. The, they call it Bayt Mal al-Muslimin. Uh, the, the, the house of uh, the welfare house of the, of the Muslims and the residents and he turned it into a different type of allowance each person had an allowance of some sort the widow had an allowance the new baby had an allowance babies being breastfed had an allowance for two years the children up to a certain age had an allowance parenting allowance for their mother and for their father the divorced woman had an allowance a man who was single had an allowance so they can get married a man who had no job had an allowance to go and work and try and make himself a business. A person who wanted to study had an allowance. The uh, soldiers had an allowance. Everyone had, the non-Muslims had an allowance. Everybody had an allowance of some sort to help them. So Khalid bin Umar radiallahu anhu made this system. And we still have it today here in Australia, Centrelink. Now, he also radiallahu anhu, he got himself a small monthly salary. He is the leader of the believers of the world. So he's higher than an emperor, higher than a president, of course. And he only had a monthly salary, very small, enough for him and his family to meet his day-to-day day, day -day needs. Besides that, he would not spend a cent of the public money on himself or his family. He was in charge of the treasury, but he wouldn't spend any of it on himself so much so listen to this he used to have a lantern that he lit up in that lantern you have to put fuel if he was doing work for public affairs for the community he would use the lantern to see at night and when he finished and he came time to his personal time he switched off he 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 um he he he, he um he blew out the, the, the lantern i'm tired today he blew out the lantern, subhanAllah. 
and he would not use anything for himself beyond his salary to that point uh, he personally as I said walked in the city at night and to check on the residents and their needs and anyone who was in need he would next day go and help them like a laborer all the citizens were equal before the law that Umar radiallahu anhu placed according to the Sharia so much so that he established something called separation of powers I mentioned this last talk it's when the state and the court system is separate there's no conflict of interest everybody is subjected to the same judgment so much so that once someone complained about Umar radiallahu anhu can you imagine someone's complaining about the Khalifa someone's complaining like about let's say if there was an emperor complaining about the emperor about the king some farmer who's not known nobody knows who he is or she is comes and complains can you imagine that complains about the king you've wronged me can you imagine the king coming and saying let's go before the court no way Umar radiallahu anhu says no worries what would you like to do he says I want to take you to court Umar radiallahu anhu goes to the court and the judge, when he sees Umar radiallahu anhu, he stands up for him. The judge stood up for Umar. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen. And Umar radiallahu anhu frowned and shouted at him. He said to the judge, This is the first injustice you have done to the plaintiff. You know the plaintiff? The one who's complaining. This is the first injustice you have done to the plaintiff. <laughs> By standing up for me. You've honored me and favored, favored me. You see? You'll see that Ali radiallahu anhu did the same. I'll tell you quickly. Ali radiallahu anhu, when he became the Khalifa, followed the same footsteps. One time a Jewish man, Jewish, he claimed that Ali radiallahu anhu had his shield. Sorry. Ali radiallahu anhu saw his shield with the Jew. Shield. And he said, that's my shield. You took it. He goes, no, you got no evidence. It's mine. Prove it said good we'll go to the court they went to the court Shurahbil at the time of Ali radiallahu anhu and he said oh he called Ali radiallahu anhu with an honorable name and Ali rebuked him and said to him you have dealt unjustly call me the same name as the plaintiff as the Jew he said Ali what evidence do you have that the shield is yours because the law in Islam is the claimant needs evidence and the denier the plaintiff the, the person who denies the accused needs to swear oath and says I deny Ali radiallahu anhu did not have any evidence he said I, I just my own claim my own word against his then he said to the Jew do you swear by God or by your Torah that you that this shield is yours he said yes I swear so the judge says, based on the evidence, the I can only say the shield is the Jews. And Ali radiallahu smiled and left. He said, thank you, because Ali radiallahu wanted him to rule by Allah's law, and that is justice. When they left, the Jew handed over the shield to Ali radiallahu anhu and said, your religion is a religion that deserves to be followed. And he ended up converting to Islam because of the justice system of Islam. Compare that to today. My brothers and sisters, any man, woman, or child could stop Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu in the middle of the street and talk to him or point out his mistakes. They could turn and say, Umar, you did this. You've got this. You, your problem is that. And Umar radiallahu anhu would never rebuke anybody. In fact, this is what he would say. A child or a woman or a man, anyone, high or low, wealthy or, or not, if they told him his fault, he would smile and say, Rahim Allahu mri'in ahda ilayya ayubi. May Allah have mercy on anyone who gifts me, who gifts me advice about my shortcomings. He called it a gift. And truly it is so. You know, brothers and sisters, you should not run away from criticism. Criticism helps you to understand yourself and not to make the same mistakes. A foolish person who makes the mistakes for years, get embarrassed once and learn rather than staying embarrassed and people talking about you as a fool for 10 years. Umar al-Khattab used to say, may Allah have mercy on the person who points out my mistakes. And it's a, I consider it a gift. Truly it is a gift. My brothers and sisters, next, his governors. He was one, the first one to put governors 
in different states. You know how we now have, similar to we have the Premier of Victoria, Premier of New South Wales, like that. And we have the Governor General, and then, so governors. Umar radiallahu anhu, he placed governors. And this is what it, these are the conditions he placed on the governors. He said, the governors are one of the people. They are ordinary people. They don't get any special treatment. That's number one. So much so that he told them they were ordered to get the people's opinions and to eat simple food like everyone else. They had to dress like everyone else. They had to wear simple clothing. They were forbidden to build porches. You know the porch? Veranda? They were forbidden to build porches in front of their homes, their houses. They were forbidden to have doorkeepers. They had to be one of the people. And they must meet and be on call for the people. And he had inspectors that would go and inspect on the governor's actions and their day-to-day -day movements, checking that they did their job. Not spies. This is halal, to check on them if they are fulfilling the job, because this is the community, the ummah. Once he heard about a governor of his who cut himself off from the people. He had enough of people. So he started to isolate himself. So he ordered that he take, be taken off his post and put out to tend to a herd of sheep in the desert. <laughs> Since you like isolation and being alone, okay, I'll take you off your post. Your job is now to go and look after people's sheep. And that's what he went and did. Nice and just want to stay away from everyone. And that's why Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to say, المؤمن الذي يخالط الناس ويصبر على أذاهم خير من المؤمن من المسلم المسلم خير من المسلم الذي لا يخالط الناس ولا يصبر على أذاهم. The Muslim who mixes with the people and does good duties and then is patient with the hurt and the hurtful words and actions that they do to them is far better and more beneficial than a Muslim who sits away from the people to avoid hearing things that hurt them or harm. So obviously, when you want to work and do things. You're going to be subjected to tests and trials all the time, my brothers and sisters. And that's what separates the leader from the one who is not, separates the one who achieves from the one who doesn't. He once put an, a woman, he also put a woman inspector to inspect that the tradesmen, tradespeople were doing fair trade. She would inspect them. And whenever she walked into the uh, market, all the tradesmen, they started to sweat and shiver because she's out there. Her name was Al Khansa, and she'd come out and make sure everybody is doing fair trade. My brothers and sisters, once there was a master who slapped his slave. Slavery was still allowed, but they were given rights never given before. And then soon the slaves were slowly liberated. But they were still slaves, and they had to be treated with honor and respect and fed like what their families are fed. And if they work, they can buy themselves out. There's a long story about it. If, if Islam had eliminated slavery straight away, they would have become public property, my dear brothers and sisters. A lot of people have asked me about slavery, and they say, How, why did Islam allow slaves? The answer to that is number one. Islam is not the one that made slaves. Slaves had existed for thousands of years. No one knows when it began. When, is, when the Prophet ﷺ came into this world with the message, the slaves were already there. If Islam came to abolish slavery straight away, those slaves would automatically become public property. They would be harmed, raped, abused, and stolen because they had been in that situation for hundreds and thousands of years. Number three, Islam did not eradicate slavery that way. Rather, it did it systematically. It started to, if, if a Muslim had a slave, they had laws, they had rights, freedom of religion, freedom to use their wealth, if they had any skills, they could buy themselves out. If uh, a woman slave had a child, she can also, she was, no, she was called Ummu, so and so, she was honored, she had a different name and she had different rights. Uh, and Islam came with liberating them by encouraging people to free their slave in public, to atone for their sins, uh, to free slaves, buy them and free them in public. And not just to eradicate it just like that. It wasn't going to work. And slowly, alhamdulillah, slaves started to get liberated. And, and subhanAllah, in the end, the Mamluks, if you ever heard of them in the 12th century, they're the ones who became the Ottoman Empire. 
They were the slaves who were liberated from Islam, came out, and Allah gave them the Khilafah, the Ottoman Empire. My brothers and sisters, there was a master who mistreated his slave. The story goes like this, that he had a horse, he had two horses, and he said to his servant, race me on that horse. And the slave's horse beat the horse of his master. The master had an ego issue. So he slapped his slave. Why did you run in front of me? Obviously he regretted it, but at the time of anger he just slapped him. Just, you're a slave. Something happened to him just out of anger. The slave went and complained to Umar. Umar summoned the master. And the master comes from a noble family. He said to him, uh, is it true? He said, it's true. He said, you had no right. Slave, uh, your, I, I now order that your slave you are entrusted with slap you back the same way you slapped him. Do you agree? And the master said, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, can you compare the stars in the sky to grains of sand on earth? Come on, I'm a star in the sky. Here's a grain in the earth. Obviously, he still had ignorance in him. Umar radiallahu anhu said, absolutely not. He goes, why? Because, because Islam came and he put all our cheeks beneath the truth. All us beneath the truth. I give you three days to think about it. You will come willingly or you will be punished, whipped. So the man went and ran away from the city and never came back. Subhanallah. So Umar radiallahu anhu and Islam is like that. There is a story about Umar radiallahu anhu and Abu Bakr. I'm sure you guys have all heard it. It's a famous one. It sheds the tears. It really flutters the heart. And it plays with the emotions, subhanAllah. And I, the story of Umar radiallahu anhu when uh, it says that he uh, used to help or serve an old woman who was blind in a house in Medina. And whenever he goes to help her, he would find that her house and everything was ready. It was cleaned. Her clothes were clean, her food was ready, her goat was milked, and so on. And he would find it all ready, and he would ask her, he asked her once, who is it that comes here, you know, how, do, how do you do this? And she said, wallahi, I don't know, another man, he comes here, I don't see him, I don't know him, I don't talk to him, he just does everything for me, and he goes. So he went and investigated and found out, he, he went and waited earlier, before Fajr, and he found that it was Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, who was coming early, early in the night to help this woman. And then he said, you have truly uh, exhausted everyone who came after you, Abu Bakr. Now that statement is a true statement. Now brothers and sisters, I'm going to disappoint you by telling you that this story is very weak. There's no authenticity to it. Its chain of narration is very weak and it cannot be relied on. I wish it was true. But it's even a contradiction a bit. Abu Bakr the line would not enter upon a woman by herself in the middle of the night. Okay, this is haram. You might say she's an old woman, but even if she's an old woman. All right, yes, you can meet an old woman. You can actually touch her hand. You can put your hand on her even if she comes. I had once an old woman who's 80 years old. She kissed me. Shluck, shluck, right here and there. It's like I'm her son or something. But an old woman's okay. And even if her hijab came off a little bit for an old woman in the Quran, it says this, it's okay. But you don't go in the middle of the night alone, enter upon a woman, stay there for an hour or two, wash her clothes and do everything by yourselves for many nights. That's not what the companions used to do. They would seek permission, they would get someone along with them, they would have their mahrams, they would something. But brothers and sisters, the story itself, unfortunately, it is not authentic. But I do have another one. Once Rasul uh, Umar was standing and he realized that the people who were getting married young people who were getting married, a culture was developing. The culture that was developing was that people were making marriage harder and harder. How? By making the mahar, the dowry of the woman, the sadaq, I'll explain it in a minute, they started to make it higher and higher. When you go and ask for a woman's hand, her father, or her family would say, I want a higher mahar for my daughter. So Umar Dilanhu, he realized that people were going to find it hard to seek the halal avenue. They're not going to be able to get married because it's so expensive. And there were still poor people there. 
So he one day stood up and he said, if the mother of a woman, the dowry upon marriage, also called in the Quran Sadaq, which means a token of honesty, a token of honesty or a pledge of honesty to the woman you want to marry. That's what it's called. Or you can also call it a bridal gift that denotes honesty. He said, if it was meant to be uh, a type of honoring her by giving her, by, by, by requesting higher, higher, higher mahars and competing with it, then you are not. A woman is not honored by monetary gifts. And then he said, do not make it expensive. And if you think that it's taqwa to Allah, if you think you're going to get closer to Allah by making the mahar even higher and higher, then it's not. Because if it was extra of honoring and if it was extra taqwa in Allah, the Messenger وسلم, himself would have beating, beaten you to it. He would have put a higher mahar for his wives and his daughters. And then Umar said, there is no one more honest than the Prophet ﷺ. There is no one more generous than the Prophet ﷺ. And there is no one who is more God conscious than the Messenger ﷺ. And then he said, he never gave to any of his wives or asked for any of his daughters a mahar more than 400 dirhams. 400 dirhams. To today's value, I'm not sure. Maybe... Maybe, maybe about a thousand dollars or something like that, Australian, or two thousand. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, putting the mahar too high creates enmity between the spouses. The husband will one day say, you cost me this much. It turns into a purchase price. It turns into a commodity like he's buying her, like she's a product. And that's what he said. He said, and it can cause enmity between relatives. Now, there is a story after that. They say that a woman stood up and he said, you're wrong. You can't limit mahar to 400 dirhams. Because Allah says in the Quran, If you had given or pledged to your wife, a kintar, which is a camel load of gold, of mahar, then you must fulfill it. And the story goes that Umar anhu then stepped down and said, everyone is more knowledgeable than Umar, and Umar has made a mistake, and the woman is right. Then he climbed back up and corrected himself, and he said, the woman is right, I am wrong. I will not make it a, a law anymore, but only a suggestion. That part about the woman negating Umar anhu, saying him the ayah, is... Not, not authentic. There is no authenticity to that statement, but the rest of it is. And, it's, and, and Umar Dawan has said it in different ways as well. The true story is that he just said, I was about to make a law that limits the mahar to 400 dirhams, but then I remembered Allah's statement in the Quran, and if you want to marry a woman, if you want to divorce your wife and marry another wife, and you had already pledged to her, a camel load of gold in mahar, then you must give it to her and do not take anything out of it. Would you take something that is not rightfully yours out of oppression and out of transgression? Uh, what this verse means is that if you agree to a mahar that is a lot, $100,000, $200,000, and you agreed to it, O oh men, you must fulfill it. Unless your wife forgives you and says, I don't want it. And you're not allowed to even pressure her. You're not allowed to tell her, what are you going to do with the mahar? You want to review the mahar a little bit? Everything I've done for you, I've gone places, I've taken you out, we bought this house, I did it. Come on, man. You're breaking my back. Change the mahar, change. And then he starts to fight with it. This is haram. This is haram. In fact, it reaches a state of major sin. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-Mu'minuna عند شروطهم Believers have to fulfill their contracts and their conditions. Now, to talk a little bit about that mahar, I'll tell you something. The mahar, my dear brothers and sisters, 
is a right of the bride stated in the Quran give to the women that you marry their right that you had pledged in honesty at the time of your marriage contract nihla means out of pure heartedness and not in exchange for a repayment so you're giving it there's nothing in return and it is agreed upon by you the husband the proposing the prospective other the wife that you want to marry and her father her wali you talk about it she talks to her dad she talks to her mother she talks to her family but we have the father because women may be embarrassed to come up and talk to this fiance about money and what she wants so in Islam Allah has placed the next of kin to talk on her behalf in case she gets embarrassed and we don't want to lower the standard of our sisters by talking about monetary value she is above that and it's all about the man's generosity and he is the one to come and talk about it and offer from himself so he talks with her father he can talk with her especially if she's been married before she has more of a say and she's encouraged to speak up more because she's now had experience with men and she can understand her uh, own circumstances a bit better she's more independent yani. so Islam came not to degrade the woman but to honor her and to really look after her emotions and to look after her dignity and to look after her feelings and to look after her honor in every way so they negotiate and they come to an agreement that the, that the husband or the prospective spouse within his capacity and ability now Islam strongly recommends and emphasizes to not make it too much to make it less everything in the Quran everything in Hadith is about making things easy on Muslims on people yassiru wa la tu'assiru make things easy don't make them difficult if we make the halal difficult guess what becomes easy the haram but if we make the halal easy the haram becomes difficult in fact people run away from marriage who can afford a hundred thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars to pay up front for a marriage on top of that the wedding and the dress and the diamond rings and the jewelry and the ups and downs and the honeymoon and the car and come on this is no one wants to get married anymore like that so we need to make marriage easy as much as we can fathers and mothers and brides don't get too hooked up with monetary value subhanallah so what is this mahar this mahar is an evidence of the man's honesty to the wife that he will he is ready to spend and to work to provide her even if she is a millionaire even if she is a millionaire it's not her duty a woman is never responsible to spend any money on any member of her family not on her children not on her husband not on her father guys it's killing me to say it but I have to say it because I'm a man but this is what Islam says she has other duties in return Allah says any rights that are against them they have rights that are for them any rights for the husband that are for them there are rights that are against them each one has it's balanced out but men have one extra degree and that is they, are, they have a responsibility of accountability for the affairs the protection and the affairs of their family one of them has to be finally responsible and Islam has made the man responsible the woman has to get pregnant the woman has to give birth the man doesn't do these things so it's more rightful for the man to have the leadership role bil ma'roof Allah says bil ma'roof means within reason within goodness based on mercy based on compassion based on understanding based like that not based on um, chivalry or um, misogyny or uh, what do you call it overpowering no no men are not better than women women are not better than men evidence of his seriousness are you serious about this marriage take something out of your pocket and give it you know brothers and sisters Islam understands the psychology of men and women have you ever been to an all-you-can-eat restaurant all-you-can-eat you never been why not you go to an all-you-can-eat restaurant oh, the jokes not gonna work now anyone been okay we've been all right you got you get it Jamal has so you go to an all-you-can-eat restaurant with your wife okay and you got your children let's say you went with your sister with your sister-in-law and her brother and your brother everybody right you all went there now look at the men and look at the women especially look at the men who have paid all right even if the woman paid check out the psychology when they go to all their beautiful food the men don't care what it tastes like anymore <laughs> it can taste like rubbish 
but they're going to get the value of their money. <laughs> they gotta, they'll fill themselves until they get sick, but they've got to get the value of their money. What do women do mostly? Mm, I like that color. I like that taste. I'll give it a little taste of this, and I'll go and eat a little bit over here. She'll probably eat a little bit, maybe worth $5, $10, so long as she likes it. What about the money? Don't you love your wife? Don't you love your daughter, your sister? That's how we think, subhanAllah. The man thinks monetarily a lot, subhanAllah. And that's why in history we learned that women were more generous in sadaqah, actually, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I, I hear a lot from about the Aisha, Dalan, Asma, and all the women. Anyway, so men's psychology is if you take from their money, it's hard. And Allah says to him, you've got to give that mahar if you are honest. It's an evidence of your honesty. Also, it's a gesture of valuing and honoring her. You buy a jewelry, you buy a gift with her agreement, with her consent. And Islam did not place a specific value, otherwise it becomes a purchase. Once you place a value on something, it means it's a sale. But it's not. He left it open for your culture, your customs, your communication, you talk about it within your ability, with your mercy and your goodness. That's how it's done, inshallah. <clears throat> My dear brothers and sisters, if a person gets married and the contract is done, but they have not consummated the marriage, they haven't yet been alone together, and they decide to divorce, to leave after the contract has been signed, we call it the nikah contract, or the katb kitab, or the aqd al-qiran, the KK. And they leave each other, half of the mahar is due to the wife. Half. Because they have not consummated the marriage. Do you know what consummated means? We've got little children here. But if they consummate the marriage, then the full mahar is due forever, anytime. Unless she says, no, I don't want it anymore. Allah says, فَكُلُوهُ هَنِيَةً مَرِيَةً Then you can consume it and take it back and don't worry. So long as your wives have forgiven you and said they've foregone it. My brothers and sisters, this is a long topic. I'll finish it with one more issue of one more thing about Umar and then his death. Umar Adelana once saw a man named Hudayfa. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman was the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Was called Kati Musir al-Nabi. He was the one who the Prophet used to tell him secrets. That he said to him, these secrets right now you don't tell the Muslims yet until after my death and so on. Among the secrets he used to tell him is who Allah told him who were the hypocrites living among them. He told him, I'll tell you and after my death so you guys can take care of it. While these hypocrites are here, I will protect you, but don't say about him because I don't want the people, he used to say, I don't want the people to think that Muhammad sallam, kills his companions because the hypocrites were very inconspicuous. Everyone thought they were Muslims and when if you're going to kill them, people are going to think the Prophet kills his companions. So he left them alone. But Hudayf ibn al-Yaman was a very noble, amazing companion. At the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, when Islam expanded, Muslims expanded, they met obviously people of different nationalities, of different races and colors. And Hudayfa comes along and he had married a Christian woman. I think she was from among the Romans, the Byzantines. He married her. And uh, you know in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows uh, us to men to allows us to men and women to eat from the slaughtered animal livestock of a Christian or a Jew who has slaughtered it, Ahlul Kitab, and also he allowed the men in the Quran to marry from the women of the people of the book. That needs another lecture on its own. Why? However, cutting the story short, Hudayfa radiallahu had married a Christian woman. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said to him, Ya Hudayfa, talliqha, divorce her. He said, Why, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, is it not in the Qur'an? Have I missed a verse? Has Allah made it haram? He's sincerely asking. He said, No, it is halal. But Ya Hudayfa, you are a role model. And people will follow you because you are a role model. And the women of the Byzantians... Because they don't dress like our women and they don't have boundaries like the way our women have, they're going to be more exposed to the public. They will start to attract the men because they show themselves. When I say show themselves, not like today. They're still covered. They're still covered, brothers and sisters. They covered their hair. But they show their neck, show a bit of their arms. Sometimes they wear tight. Sometimes their legs would show. Not like the Muslim women in those times. And... 
he said Muslim men will be attracted to them and because of the ayah and because you're a role model they'll start marrying them and I fear that they will forget about our women the Muslim women because they're not as exposed as them the men will foolishly start going for them and forget about our women our women will not find suitable husbands or they will be forgotten so divorce her ya Hudayfa so that this doesn't happen and Hudayfa divorced her for the sake of Allah gave her her mahar looked after her and obviously he treated her well and honored her we learn from this brothers and sisters that Allah says Allah says وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنْ وَلَأَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكَةٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ Do not marry the mushrikeen, the people who associate pounds with Allah, the polytheists, until they believe. And a believing woman is much better for you than a disbelieving woman, even if the disbelieving woman happens to attract you. These are talking about non ahl al-kitab. And in general, ahl al-kitab, if they are looked at more than the believing women. And Allah also says, وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنُوا Women also don't marry the polytheist men until they believe. Allah says, and a believing man is far better for you than a disbelieving man, even if the disbelieving man is more attractive to you. Now, of course, when we talk about believers, not just any believers, you might say to me, oh, come on, man, there's some believing men, they're just so toxic. Some believing women are so toxic. I agree with you. Not all Muslims are the same. What this ayah is talking about is you study their character, you go and ask about them, and when you see that they are truly people who have the character of Islam, they are far better for you. There's more compatibility, you have less problems when it comes to your religion, to your social life. Obviously, you look at your compatibility with your personalities, that's another thing. Your children, when you have them, inshallah, even if you get divorced, a believing man or a believing woman, imagine you get divorced and you start hating each other. Some people hate each other and they start talking about each other. No matter what happens, with sadness, of course, it shouldn't be like that. But let's say that did happen. At least, at least, both parents will know to raise their children on Islam. Because most people, when, when they leave each other, they want to do the opposite. Everything that they did within the marriage, they want to do the opposite. Some kind of revenge of some sort that's twisted. But at least the children will learn to remain Muslim. And the believers, they have more compatibility. Like you can marry a Christian, Christmas time comes, you're going to be compromised. What will you do with the family and your love and your compassion and all of that stuff? How are you going to tell your children? What are you going to do? You're going to have to cut corners. Uh, Easter time comes. I know, a brother, I know many brothers and sisters who have come to me, they want to marry someone who's non-Muslim. And then they say they want to convert. And I question, I say, okay, if you want to convert, let's give them time. No, they want to convert now. And most of the times I sit with them and they say to me, I want to convert um, because I love her, because I love him. So you don't convert to Islam out of love. You don't do it for someone. They don't, you don't belong to them. They don't own you. You don't change your life for them. He's not your God. She's not your God, goddess, right? We don't convert for people. It has to be sincere. I remember one brother, mashallah, he came here, was a non-Muslim, Christian. He wanted to marry a Muslim woman came to me here a long time ago, about 25 years ago. I was here in the masjid and he said to me, I want to marry this woman. I said, why? He said, I want to become a Muslim. I said, why do you want to become a Muslim? So I don't jump like that. He's going to become a Muslim, everybody. Let's, you know, chuck a party. No, no, no. Let, why do you want to become a Muslim? He said to me, because I want to marry this girl and I love her. And he thinks that he's doing a great thing. I said, no, brother. That woman does not own you. You don't change your religion or you don't change your color or who you are. Just for a woman, for example. Or for a man, they don't, no one owns you, not even your parents. He said, what should I do? I said, you've got to become Muslim sincerely for God, because you want to. And then when you're like that, then your marriage will be more compatible and you enjoy it even more. He said, how do I learn? I said, go learn. I gave him books, I started. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I still remember, I truly respect this brother. Two years he went. Wallahi, he did not talk to her, he didn't do anything until two years later. He came back to me and said, now I'm ready. And he converted truly, and I've seen him now, mashallah, he used to drop off his children at our school where I teach, and they've graduated from there, mashallah. 
And I've seen many like that. The opposite also happens. I remember one brother comes and says, I'm in, I'm in love with this girl. She's Christian. I said, MashaAllah, beautiful. You know, obviously, I'm being a bit sarcastic here, but I shouldn't have. However, I said, brother, listen, my advice to you is look for a Muslim woman who's compatible with you because no matter what happens, even if you have children and she leaves you or you leave her, you know that she's going to still look after him as Muslims. He didn't listen to me. One year, one and a half years later, he comes back from work here. I'm talking again 25 years ago. I said, brother, I came from work. She's not home anymore. We have a child. She took him. I said, why? He goes, I called her. She's gone back to her parents. She missed her old life. Okay. He goes, I should have listened to you. I said, well, I don't know. Try your best. What do you do? And the opposite is true as well. My brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is this. There are people who are non-Muslim who have great character. And maybe they'll be good husbands or wives temporarily for the time being. But overall, it is far better for you. As Allah says, far better for you to marry someone who's more compatible with you in your faith, in your values, and in your compatibility, your personality. That's far better. I know of people who got married, and unfortunately, uh, the, the, the wife, for example, stayed a Catholic. They wanted to convert. They called me. I went there. I said, sister, you can stay a Catholic. She goes, really? I said, yeah. And her mother said, really? I said, yeah. I said, but I thought I have to convert. I go, no, you don't have to convert. You can marry him. I'll still do the marriage. They said, what a relief. Looked at um, the, the brother, and I said to him, see? She wasn't going to become a true Muslim. Achish. She might as well stay like that. Don't, Islam is not to be played with. Let her stay like that, marry her. Hopefully, inshallah, she'll learn. If she doesn't convert, at least she'll love Islam. Subhanallah, they went and he, he baptized his children. He, they went and did their marriage also at the church after they did it with us. They, yani, there's shirk involved. But alhamdulillah, I met them now. Alhamdulillah, the sister, although she's not a Muslim yet, but she loves Islam, she's very close to it. So alhamdulillah, sometimes good comes out of it. But after what? And some of them just went, kept on going and going and going. Subhanallah. So brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is, Insha'Allah, try to think a little bit wider and choose the right spouse, even if they're Muslim, still don't rush to it just because they're Muslim. There are good Muslims and bad Muslims. You've got to do a bit of research. But my advice is, even if they're not Muslim, my advice to you, there's, the compatibility is going to be less. And you're only going to stay at a certain limit. If you want to get more religious, there's going to be problems, you know. I don't know, am I saying the right thing? Do you agree or kind of? I mean, you might have some other points against it. I, I, I accept that. But just talking from my own personal experience, Allahu Alam. Although it is halal still. I've done many marriages for people who, uh, brothers who married uh, Christians, did one for a Jew. Some of them brothers converted. And alhamdulillah, yani, we hope, inshallah, they're going well. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say about that. I think there's a little bit of time for salat. I reached up to the point where I wanted to talk about the death of Umar radiallahu anhu and the next Khalifa. I will talk about his death and I'll leave the election of the Khalifa Uthman to next week. So, Umar radiallahu anhu, this hadith is in Bukhari, this man Hudayfa, he said to him, who has memorized a hadith from the Prophet? And Hudayfa said, I did, Ya Rasulullah. I, I did, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, tell me. He said, he said a hadith to him, and then he said, no, no, no. Give me a hadith about the signs of the last hour. A hadith that talks about the waves that come to us of fitna one by one. He said to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, one of the signs of the last hour, and, the, and that will cause the fitnas to come like waves till the end of time. Oh, Umar, you don't have to worry about it because there is a door between you and it. Metaphorical door. And then Umar said to him, tell me, did the Prophet, peace be upon him, say that this door will open for the fitna? Or did he say the door will be broken and the fitna will come? And he said to him, no, he said it will be broken and the fitnas will come till the end of time. Then Umar said, if he, the Prophet ﷺ said the door will be broken, it means it will never close again. Meaning the fitna between the Muslim ummah and the world will continue like waves. It will go and come, go and come, go and come until the last hour. The next day they said, do, do you know who that man is? And then Hudayfa said, and Umar said, it is Umar. Umar is the door. If he dies, the door is broken. 
And so the fitness began after him. From the death of Umar onwards, the fitness, the mischiefs, the calamities began. And the fights and the turmoils. There was a Persian, Persian slave named Abu Lu'lu'a, the Magan, or the Majan, who was a fire worshipper from Persia. And he had a master in Medina who was a Muslim. And this Majan, Abu Lu'lu'a, he, there was a, a rule that anyone who did trade, they had to pay a minimum tax. The minimum tax was, I think it was half a tenth very small amount at 0.05% of your profits. And the masters of the slave had to collect it from their masters and give it to the, the, uh, the, the Muslim government. So Abu Lu'lu'a, he came up to Umar and complained that his master is taking too much tax from him. He should take even less than that. He said, do you have a trade? Do you have skill? He goes, yeah, I'm a painter, I'm a builder, I'm a carpenter, I'm all that stuff. He said, well, I don't think there's any problems for you. You can pay the full tax, not a problem. And Abu Lu'lu'a had it in for him. He said to him, I'm going to show you. He threatened him. And Omar walked away just smiling and laughing and said, look, now I've got him threatening me. After a few days, that man, he poisoned a dagger overnight. And then in Fajr prayer, Abu Lu'lu'a was praying with the people. Obviously, he's not a Muslim. And in Insujud, he got up and slowly went to Amir al-Mu'minin while he was in Sujud. And he stabbed him several stabs, over six or seven stabs into his stomach, and then he ripped his stomach out until his inner intestines fell out. Umar ibn al-Khattab then went unconscious and fell to the ground, and then Abu Lu'lu'a killed himself. The Muslims got up, noticing that Amir al-Mu'minin had not gotten out of his sujood. They raced him, and his son Abdullah, his name is Abdullah, raced him. He tried to put his intestines and everything back in but they kept dropping out the hole was too big subhanallah so they carried him to his house and laid him there and got a doctor while Amir al-Mu'minin was still unconscious the doctor looks at the wounds and the poison he says it's traveled through his blood you have to farewell him he's got a day or two to survive he's going to die so his children everybody came and gathered around Amir al-Mu'minin and then Umar radiallahu anhu woke up and the first thing he said was asalla nas did the people finish their prayer and they said yes ya amir al-mu'min they finished their salat he said alhamdulillah he doesn't want to be responsible for the muslims not finishing their fajr salat then he said who is it that stabbed me they said abu lu'lu al-majusi he said i knew he had it in for me since that day when i told him the truth he said but alhamdulillah that it was someone who is not muslim because on the day of judgment, I won't feel bad that I have to stand before Allah in the court of Allah and complain about a Muslim instead of a non-Muslim. At least I won't feel that bad on that day because he's already chosen not to believe in God. And then Umar radiallahu anhu gathered his companions and he said to them, listen, I know now I've seen, he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa while he was unconscious in his dreams. And he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr and the Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, you will break your fast with us, ya Umar. So Umar every day stayed fasting, and he said to his son, Abdullah, I'm going to go now. I'm about to die. So I'm going to remain fasting, because I'm going to meet the Prophet, sallallahu fasting. We're going to break our fast together. He gathered his companions, and he said to them, I cannot leave this world without, first of all, laying the foundation and the plan for you to elect a Khalifa after me. I cannot leave this world while the people without a Khalifa. The first thing they said to him is, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you just choose who the Khalifa will be and we will all follow. And then Umar said to them, Oh no. Oh no. Enough for me to be judged for the people in while I'm living. You want me also to hold responsibility of the people after I have died? I don't want that responsibility. You do a shura. You go and you talk among each other. And you decide collectively. Then they said to him, how about your son, Abdullah? He said, oh no. It's enough for one member of Al-Khattab family to be questioned on the day of judgment and stand before Allah than having two members. That's enough. Don't bring my son into it. La ilaha illallah. Look at the opposite. And he was aware not to turn it into a monarchy. You know, like a king giving it to his family. Then my dear brothers and sisters, I will talk inshallah next week about the precise plan he laid out for them because it's a beautiful plan and a long plan.
But I'll talk about how he passed away now, inshallah, and leave that till next week and follow up with Uthman radiallahu anhu's story. He went to his son Abdullah. Sorry, his son Abdullah came to him and laid his father's head on his lap. Abdullah, his son, laid his father's head on his lap. And he's just sort of stroking his hair and father and making dua for him. Then Umar radiallahu anhu teared up. And he said, my son, place my cheek on the floor. Take it off your lap. He said, why? I mean, he goes, place it on the floor. Humble before Allah. Allah created me from the soil and I belong to the soil. Place it on the floor. He said, but you are Amir al-Mu'mineen. He goes, no, today I am not anymore. Today I am not Amir al-Mu'mineen. My role has, is finished. I am now turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Abdullah, I want you to go to Aisha radiallahu anha and ask her permission if I can be buried in her spot next to her father and Rasulullah. So he went to Aisha and said, Amir al-Umar asks you if he can. He said, and don't say Amir al-Mu'mineen. Say Umar. Umar asks you. Use my name. He said, Umar asks you permission to be buried in the slot that you've preserved so that you can, you can, uh, so he can be buried in it. And she said, if it was anyone else who asked me, I would have said no. But for Umar, I allow him. He came back and said, he gave, she gave you permission, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, please go back again tomorrow and ask her again in case she was embarrassed. Give her time to think about it. I want it to be from her heart. He went the next day and she still approved. And that night, it was Thursday. And Umar radiallahu anhu was 63 years old. And when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away, he was also 63 years old. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, he was also 63 years old, subhanallah. Except that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away on a Monday, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away on a Monday, Umar radiallahu anhu passed away on a Thursday night, which is called the night of the Friday, and he returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, Umar radiallahu anhu is buried. If you go to Medina, you'll see as you're passing, you'll see three, three uh, small holes that you can look through. You can't see their grave, it's been covered. Uh, and uh, it's a long story to it. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grave is first, it's a little bit forward. And then there is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, a little bit further away on the, on the side of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the length of his shoulders, Abu Bakr's head is where the shoulders of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. And then Umar is a little bit further out at the shoulders of Abu Bakr radiallahu so at the waist of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so that's how the order was and that was the backyard the orchard backyard of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa house which was also Aisha radiallahu anha's house that was connected to the masjid my dear brothers and sisters this is the story of Umar radiallahu anhu inshallah next week we will talk about how the next Khalifa was elected and what bequest and plan that Umar radiallahu anhu had laid in place to show you his true uh, honesty and trustworthiness when he came to the leadership and responsibility of the Ummah.